Welcome to the Renegade Nutrition Podcast, where we discuss all things wellness. I'm Eleni Welch, nutritionist. And I'm Kay Boyer, health enthusiast. Welcome back, Renegades. Welcome, Renegades. Welcome. We have a very smart and charming and wonderful guest today named Megan Lyons. Yes. Welcome mm-hmm. to the show, Megan. We're so excited to have you on. So Megan is Thank a you health- so much. Oh, you're yeah, welcome. I'm excited. You're welcome. Yes. Megan's a health and wellness expert. Mm-hmm. And now you were a Harvard graduate. That's amazing. MBA. Good job. Yep. Former management consultant. And then you essentially left that corporate world to dive into the world of nutrition, which I'm I'm ready to ask you about that journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have a master's degree in holistic nutrition and you're double board certified holistic nutrition and clinical nutrition, right? Um, and then you're currently yes. pursuing your doctorate of clinical nutrition. So you are one busy, yes, accomplished busy and smart woman. lady. <laughs> yes. Good. We're honored to have Thank you on our you. podcast. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so I... I'm honored to be here. Well, mm. thanks. Awesome. Well, I I think my burning question since I learned about you and your work was, what brought you from that, what seems like a very successful corporate job into the world of wellness because usually those changes don't happen without a pretty significant reason so i'm yes <laughs> and what drew you to the, the nutritional natural side of things yes yep. definitely tell us absolutely so i don't have like a one this is my one crisis moment for for me it was much more of a slow crumble <laughs> where okay. i started even as a child putting a ton of pressure on myself i've always loved school and loved learning and all of that and the way that i measured my um success in life was just how much could i possibly be hard charging how much could i outwork the next person how much could i go 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 and that got me really far until it didn't (laughs) yeah yeah exactly so it works. I always say I work with a lot of high achievers. Like I get it. It did work. It does work in a lot of aspects. And it's not something about ourselves that we just want to totally shut off. But at some point, whoo, you're really feeling the impact of all of that hard charging. And for me, that came about three or so years into consulting. I started feeling like, okay, I like my job. I I can really appreciate all of the experiences I'm getting, all of that, but I don't love my job. It's not my passion. And what it's taking away from me in traveling 48 weeks a year, Oof. in working these 80-hour weeks for something that I'm not really passionate about, mm-hmm. it's taking away a whole lot. So yeah. I started realizing that I had zero energy. I was super snappy, especially with those people I loved most. I could hold it together completely at work. But then with my husband, my parents, my sister, all of that, I was just like raging uh, in a not good way. I was not able to sleep very well. I went to a doctor before I knew about this whole health world. And I was 26 at the time. And she looked at me and she said, wow, I work with mostly postmenopausal women and your hormones are worse than theirs. And I finally was like, oh no, something is really happening. I can no longer ignore that my way of life of like hard charging and go, 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 it's actually slowly deteriorating my health and it's not gonna keep me going this way for a long time. So unfortunately her solution at the time was like, hey, I don't know what to do. I don't know why this happened, she said to me. I don't know why you could possibly have low hormones. And I was like, it's because I'm stressed. It's because I'm stressed. And she was like, no, (laughs) something must be wrong. You probably just should be on hormones for the rest of your life. Now, no hate on uh, people who need hormones. But at that point, the answer for me was not that I needed to be on hormones for the rest of my life. The answer was that I needed to holistically pay attention to my nutrition, my sleep, my stress management, Mm. my movement. I've always been more on the side of over exercising than Mm. under. And so I started just with my own journey thinking there's got to be a better way than popping these pills for the rest of my life. That 
really steamrolled into this whole world of what used to be called alternative medicine, then holistic nutrition, holistic medicine, then integrative. Now we're calling it functional medicine, but basically it's like all the same thing right? Uh, with slight variations. And I haven't looked back a day since. So once I was able to really heal myself, which happened still at the old job, I was still consulting and still working these long hours, although better able to set my boundaries, but feeling so much better repairing my physical and emotional self. Then I was like, okay, I have to share that with others. That was January, 2014. And I haven't looked back a day since. That's amazing. That is amazing. And I will say on the stress side of things, it's really interesting that when you are in a job you're passionate about, that lights your fire, that you love, that you look forward to every day, the stressors there can be almost beneficial stressors because you're impacting the world in the way that you want to and are called to, Mm -hmm. as opposed to like you described the corporate job, like, I like it, I don't love it, where you don't have that passion, but you're working all those long hours, then those stress stressors become harmful. Because I believe like stress can be good or bad depending on how we view it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's different when you're stressed out because you're building this business that you know is going to help people and you feel like excited about and then those stressors become exciting challenges instead mm-hmm. of burnout yeah issues you know yeah yeah, yeah. what it's so interesting you're absolutely too. yeah right yeah good it, it's just crazy that now that like we're all getting older and i've been in the hustle years with all my friends and my my peers and it's been like hustle 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 and now that i'm in my late 30s i always knew to kind of balance out my life maybe because I'm pretty more chill I don't know but for all my friends who really did push and hustle I'm seeing that that they're really having more of the severe health issues and their cortisol and their thyroid and it's like man guys in your 20s and your young 30s it's like we have to find a more balanced way of life or we are burning out like it's a thing (laughs) yeah it absolutely Absolutely is a thing. And both of you are right. First, I'll touch on the positive stress. There's a name for that. Of course, nutritionists and scientists make a name for everything. It's called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. That's stress that actually is making you stronger. So hormesis, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. That's the eustress. I'm planning a wedding and it's stressful, or I'm planning this vacation and it's stressful, or I'm building my business and I love it, but it's stressful. This is positive and it doesn't have as detrimental of an impact on your health, but it still can. So we have a cumulative stress bucket. That's all of the stress. So let's say I'm breathing in a bunch of pollution and I'm not sleeping and I'm eating food that doesn't fuel my body, but my stress, my emotional stress is coming from positive stuff. I'm still going to have those repercussions. So it's Mm -hmm. not like a free pass. It's just a little bit of a, um, less impactful thing, less impactful factor on your body with that positive stress. Man, yeah. this is I amazing. love that. I love that. I just actually read that term of the U stress, like the EU stress the other day in a book. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a good way of terming what I've kind of always known, but not known what to call it, mm-hmm. of just seeing that how people viewed their stress impacted how it affected them. But you're absolutely right. We talk about on this podcast a lot. We refer to it as that like cup of water, right? And all the stresses that you're adding in are one drop, one drop, one drop, one drop. And eventually that cup will overflow. And the drop that overflows it might be different for everybody. And so it's one of the things I always talk to my clients about when they come to me for nutritional counseling. And they're like, well, I don't get it. My husband and I are exposed to the same things. How come, you know, how come my pesticide exposure on the farm we work on made me sick, but not him sick? And so then we get to have that conversation about like, what's the hole? Yeah, what's the hole? And like, maybe that's not the thing that's pushed him over the edge yet, but something else might push him over the edge and be that final drop that overflows his cup that doesn't overflow yours. So anyway. Um, Okay. And I know that we do want to talk about thyroid today, which I'm very interested in, but I know that you take clients one-on-one. What are sort of the main categories or influences that you walk them through and you just said some like sleep stress the toxins what are kind of the pillars that you walk through with your clients well i love that you use the word pillars because i have a program called revitalize health accelerator where i take people through 12 pillars it's a perfect word because i think there are probably infinite components of health that are important but when i thought about 
about how much I could break it down and simplify it, I came up with these 12. So goal setting is one of the pillars, macronutrients. I don't have people count every calorie, count their calories at all or count macros, but learning about how to balance that, how to balance blood sugar, things like getting in enough nourishment. So what actually is nourishment? People know vegetables are healthy, but uh, how do we nourish our bodies? How do we get those micronutrients as well? How do we eat healthily when we're traveling or on vacation or in special situations? Um, How do we, if we need to think about meal planning or food prep, any of that. And then also some of the pillars are like tangential. So sleep is important. Movement is so important. Emotional eating, we have a whole pillar on that. There are just so, oh, stress me management, of course, since I already talked about that a little bit. There are so many of these factors that people initially come to me and they think, I just want to know how much broccoli to eat or whatever. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to tell you that that's important too. But unless we have these other pillars of stress and sleep and all of this kind of stuff, honestly, you can't eat enough broccoli to outdo some of this kind of stuff. It does need balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's so interesting. I had a, which we've, I had this energy healer last year. That was this very cool experience for my life, but we interviewed her on here and she would always tell me, Kay, you're trying to be a human be or no, you're hu- yeah. trying to be a human doing, but you're a human being. And she was like, you literally have to like fully change the way that you just are. And I was like, I don't understand. Like, <laughs> and it was like, even just that, like the way that we take in the world matters to how our body physically manifests disease or wellness or whatever and like that's like was such a hard thing it's like no I want to do something I want to eat the broccoli and it's like oh I just have to start being like in more alignment with the like the earth and how you live and with people I just need to chill out and that's such a crazy answer but it it works yeah it does and honestly I wish it were the other way way. I am right. great yes. at being a human doing. Yes. I will do yes. anything for my health, my yep. business, my family. Like if you give me a list of things to do, you've got it covered. No problem. And yep. it's way harder for me to do the being part, Yes, to just take a break or yeah. to focus on my sleep. Even that was really hard for me at first. Cause I'm like, well, I'm not falling over and like passing out in the middle of the day. I can survive on this <laughs> right. little yep. sleep. But we know deep down, I think every single one of us know when we're not thriving, when we're not being that being. Yes, right. yes absolutely. absolutely. Well, I really want to dive in with you to the topic of thyroid health. Mm-hmm. Um, and and part of the question we have is we've I've seen this in my own small clinical, not clinical, but human nutrition practice, we'll call it that. Um, I've seen a lot of issues with thyroid and it seems to be a very common thing nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, are conditions really on the rise? Are we, are we getting better at IDing some of the correlating factors that connect with them? So talk to us about that. Why are thyroid conditions on the rise? Why does it seem like every other person I know has some sort of thyroid condition Mm -hmm. and, and what is the root of that? Yeah. Yes. Great question. And I wish I had a simple answer. I don't, but I can give you some general ideas. First of all, we are thankfully becoming more aware of thyroid conditions. So way back in the day when we only used to test TSH, that misses a lot of conditions and we can talk about lab testing if we want, but basically we're getting better at looking under the hood and seeing what's going on. So diagnostically, we're getting a little bit better, but still the statistic currently is 60% of people with a thyroid condition still don't know that they have one. And it is increasing. Right now, 12 to 12% of the US population will develop a thyroid condition. But I bet for our kids and our kids' kids, Mm -hmm. that's going to be 
a whole lot more. And if we look back several decades, the numbers were certainly in the single digit. So what is contributing to that? I hate to say it, but since we've already called it out, stress for sure. Mm -hmm. Your thyroid runs in this axis of your hypothalamus, your pituitary, your adrenals, all of these things that are like controlling your stress response and your thyroid's very reactive to that. So stress for sure, all kinds of toxins in our food and toxins is a word that's like really overused. We can say it's a toxic person or we can say like, you know, uh, that food is toxic and we don't really know what we're talking about. But the way I'm talking about it is anything that requires extra processing by your liver. Your liver's great at processing, you know, little bits of dust that you breathe in or regular food that you eat or whatever. But then when we're bombarding it by all of these chemicals that it has not recognized it has not evolved to know what they are that for sure throws off our whole system and inhibits our um thyroid function and then the last thing that i'll say in this kind of general bucket is that circadian rhythms have a lot to do with thyroid and we're really disrupting that by mm -hmm. kind of sleeping at weird hours by having blue light constantly by always being connected we're not as rhythmic of a society as we used to be and i think that has a big impact on our thyroid as well yeah absolutely yes, absolutely because now we're indoors and we have and and the electricity in our discovery of it is a fairly recent thing so mm -hmm. having light even at night and mm -hmm. not being by the light of a fire and going to sleep when it's dark out and waking up when it's light out like yeah <laughs> all of that has has changed for sure when you talk about the circadian rhythms and even just how the busy life that we live and things like shift work and people mm. working crazy weird hours or overnight hours and then people getting home from work and forgetting to eat till 9 p.m. and then going to bed like an hour later and then like yeah it we yeah. are really bombarding ourselves like you I think that was a good word for it, bombarding. yes yes which is always a yeah I've the argument the counter argument I've heard to the need for things like you know, detoxification and helping the liver is, no, the liver can process toxins. That's what it's made to do. All of those things on detoxification are made up because the liver can handle it. And I'm like, the liver could handle it when what we were like running into was the occasional toxic berry or mushroom. It's different when mm. we're bombarding it day after day after day with yep. different cleaners and cleaners. Makeup exactly. And, yep. Exactly. Things we put on our skin, things we breathe in, things we inhale, things we've invented in the last decade that now we're exposing ourselves to every day. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I 100% um, agree. I have a, a personal question for the like the thyroid. Um, so my husband, which I would talk about him and he'd hate it, but he doesn't listen. So he, he won't know we talked about him. But he um, he had he was like you like, go, go, go. He did this test on himself, like a goal. He was like, I'm going to work out every day for a year. And then he did it. And then he did it for two years. So he worked out 800 days in a row. This is insane, right? And wow. I and I was like, "Wow, I'm really proud of you." Well, come and to long, find out, long workouts, long, too. like like yeah, like he had to get his heart rate at a certain level for at least half a, a half hour. So I mean, it was like it, it wasn't me like doing yoga for a half hour. His was like intense. Okay, so this was one of those like, man, he's just a go getter. Okay, at the end of this 800 days, he literally had to quit because he developed Hashimoto's. Or well. It was developing, but then they kind of found out about it. But, okay, here's the story. So he couldn't sleep, and he was like, I'm in, I'm going insane. Like, I can't sleep. And I was like, honey, you probably just need to see my energy healer, right? And I was like, this is your chance when you're late at night. You just talk to God, make things right with your soul. You know what I'm saying? These kind of things. And he was like, no, 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 really, it's I cannot sleep. And so I took him to the doctor, and the doctor was like, listen, honey, you just got to clear your soul and went through this. And Kevin was like, guys, this is not, this is not right. Anyway, he got his results back and he had Hashimoto's, which is like one of the symptoms. It's like, you really cannot sleep. Like your brain is awake. And so that's when we like took him seriously now. And like, we got him all the help he needed, but all that to really say, it's true that he, when you burn like that 800 days in a row, there's going to be consequences. Um, and then that kind of, I have a question for you then. Is there a, that correlation? Have you seen that with the sleep that you actually can't sleep? 
And then what do you do to help since he's, he's on like a whole regiment and he's doing better, but it, are there things that you suggest that help with the sleep or is it just cure the whole thing and it kind of naturally takes care of itself or what should I tell my husband? Let me, let me know. <laughs> Wow. Thank you for sharing that. There are a ton of questions in there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to tackle the ones that I can, and then we can keep, you can keep reminding Mm -hmm. me. But for those people who don't know what Hashimoto's is, it's a term that is becoming again, more and more popular these days. It happens to be five to eight times more prevalent in women than men, Mm -hmm. but men still do get it, obviously, in the case of your husband and many others. And what it is, is it's an autoimmune reaction to your thyroid gland. So autoimmune basically means our body attacking itself. So people recognize autoimmune disease of the pancreas that turns into type one diabetes, your body kind of like kills the the cells that make insulin for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. There are autoimmune conditions of the skin, there are autoimmune conditions of all kinds of various um, parts of our body. And in this case, your your body if you have Hashimoto's is attacking your thyroid gland. And if you don't don't stop that. It will eventually completely neutralize your thyroid gland and you'll have to be reliant on medications for any thyroid production. Mm -hmm. And so then it kind of makes sense to say, well, what is thyroid production? Because then we'll understand what are the symptoms of Hashimoto's or other forms of of hypothyroidism. A lot of it has to do with anything related to energy. So your thyroid is like your energy center, your metabolism center. It sends out these hormones that control how well you feel awake during the day, how well you sleep, how well you control your temperature, how you metabolize food. So weight gain or weight loss, even things like libido, all kinds of hormones are related to to thyroid function. So generally when people have hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's, which causes hypothyroidism, it's everything is slow. I think Mm -hmm. of hypo low thyroid as slow. So Mm -hmm. slow digestion is constipation. Slow metabolism is gaining weight. Slow, um, energy. I don't think anyone uses that term, but in my mind, it makes Mm -hmm. sense. Slow energy is like fatigue. Mm -hmm. So maybe he's very tired, but still he can't sleep. Why could you not sleep if Mm -hmm. you have Hashimoto's? Because your body's not producing out these hormones that are essential for this sleep-wake cycle. Your body just kind of feels like, oh my gosh, I'm tired, but like I am i don't have what it takes to actually get into good quality sleep. It's just stuck in there. Mm-hmm. And the cycle goes on and on and on. People will also experience brain fog or being forgetful. Mm-hmm. People might have hair loss. People might have puffiness in their hands or face or skin, kind of dry hair, uh, dry um, skin. They might have inability to tolerate cold temperatures, all mm-hmm. these kind of things things, which now people are hearing them and either someone saying, oh my gosh, I have that. I must have hypothyroidism. And maybe they don't because they're kind of general symptoms. Or maybe they're saying, oh yes, I have all of these. I definitely need to go get checked out. And I encourage people to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those all sound very familiar. So yes, yes. And so that's a a good segue into something I was, I was curious from one nutritionist to another just to ask you is what are some of the metrics of thyroid hormones that you look for that Mm -hmm. you order for a blood test so one thing I know I've run into is there are certain metrics that I want to look at when it comes to the thyroid health and a lot of times my clients have a hard time getting their doctor to order those tests so I'm curious, yeah. what are the what are the components of thyroid health that you look for in blood work? Mm-hmm. And then how do you order those tests for your clients? Yeah, great question. And gosh, I wish that ordering labs was not such an uphill battle. Yeah. I really believe that every person should have access to any lab that they want on their own body. Yes. Like it it seems crazy to me that people have to jump through all of these hoops. So if listeners are listening to this and they're not able to get lab tests, I just, I'm sorry for you. Hopefully we're changing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But to answer your specific question, TSH is like the generic, if you get a 
quote, normal blood tests from your primary care doctor, you're going to get TSH. That's actually not a thyroid hormone at all. And I know you know this, but for our audience, what TSH is, is a hormone that's secreted from your pituitary gland that tells your thyroid hormone to produce thyroid horm- or tells your thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone. Right. So if I have not enough thyroid hormone in my body, then my pituitary is like, shouting up there. It's like, alert, alert, alert. Hey, thyroid gland, you got to get back on track. Let's make more thyroid hormones. So TSH is just that signal. Now, once your thyroid gland receives the TSH, then it starts churning out something called T4, which is a thyroid hormone that really has to get converted into T3 with the help of your liver to be used. So T3 is like what I call the gold. T3 is the really good stuff that regulates all those functions that I said before. And so it's very important to measure T3 because at the end of it, that's like the bottom of the chain. This is the stuff that's usable is the T3. So be sure that you're asking for T4 and T3. And then I think also important, maybe less so if you really have to pick your battles are free T3 and free T4. So this is like how much reserve you have of either of these things. Also, reverse T3, which is like if you're dealing with some stress or trauma or underlying infection or mold toxicity or something like that, your thyroid basically gets confused. I think of it like a U-turn. It, instead of making the good stuff, it makes a U-turn turn to reverse T3. And so that one's important to measure as well. And then last are these anti-TG and anti-TPO, which are antibodies against the thyroid. So that's how we measure Hashimoto's. So just one more time so that the audience can maybe Take understand this. Yeah. Is TSH is like baseline. And then really important is T3, but let's also get the T4, free T3, free T4 in there. And then reverse T3 to see if stress is causing it to do something wacky and TG and TPO antibodies to make sure you don't have Hashimoto. So that's what I run on my clients. And a lot of the reason why I continue to go to different programs and certifications and schools is just so I can get access to more of these labs. Right. Thyroid's not that hard, uh, not hard at all for me to order, but eventually I will order even crazier things. So that's what I would run. I'm curious though to hear, is that similar to what you would recommend or what am I missing? Yeah, no, those are pretty much exactly what I recommend. And the ones I've had trouble getting doctors to order are the f- free T3, free T4 and reverse T3. Um, and the solution we've kind of come up with, because at least in Iowa, the clinical nutrition or human nutrition uh, licensure pathway. So what I'm working towards is becoming a certified nutritional specialist, and that's not a recognized pathway in Iowa. So by Iowa standards, I can't really order labs. So typically what I do is have the patient, and, and it's not covered by insurance if I order it. So yeah. I have the uh, client go to their doctor and get whatever thyroid tests their doctor is willing to order for them, which is just varied across the board, depending on the doctor and how willing they are. Um, And then whatever they won't order, I have my clients order through walkinlabs.com, which is very helpful because you can do a thyroid panel, like a custom thyroid panel, and add in things like the free T3, free T4, and the reverse T3, which is typically what I end up doing because those are most commonly the ones that don't get measured. But every once in a while, I do have a doctor who surprises me who will order everything. And usually what I try to do is arm my clients with like the research and the information they need to ask their doctors about the tests and to say, hey, this is the research on this. This is why I'd like you to order it for me because I know for me what I found with my natural or normal prime primary care physician is um, he's even though he's a DO, he's not super naturally minded at all, I would say. But he'll order any blood tests I ask him to as long as I can bring in information that explains why I want it. And so I think some of the problem has been if a client of mine wasn't properly prepared and they don't really know why they're asking for a test and the doctor doesn't understand why they're ordering it. I mean, it's the doctor's name is on the line, right? Ordering that test. So yeah. I think it's 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 only fair to at least provide the care provider with the information that they need to understand why they're ordering that test because most doctors aren't going to if they don't see a reason to. And like my care provider had said, he's like, it's, it's just that I don't want to have you spend your money on things 
that like he doesn't think the, matters he doesn't yeah. think matters so to him he's like i just don't want you to order a bunch of tests that aren't going to provide answers and so then i came back and was like well here's all the research oh. and the reason why like i need to order those tests as long as i can provide the reason for ordering it once i discovered yes. that with my own primary care physician then i started providing my clients with those tools and i've had better not full but better success with getting their doctors to order it mm -hmm. I love that. And I love that you're equipping your clients to do that too. It's honestly not the doctor's fault. I know right. this example is trite by now, but it's still true. If I break my arm or something, I'm not going to go to a functional nutritionist to figure out what to do with my bone popping out of my skin. Like right. doctors have an amazing purpose yes. at helping with crises. Uh -huh. And I'm always going to go to a doctor in yes. the moment of a crisis, a, a Western medicine doctor. Uh -huh. But something like reverse T3, for example, which you and I are saying is important. If your reverse T3 is high right now, is that going to kill you tomorrow? Honestly, no, it's not. And so I understand why they don't have the education they need in that. And that's where we all come to play together. Yes. I think it's yes. really reassuring that many doctors are starting to hear us and say, oh, yeah, I'm not an expert in that, but I get it. If you can show me the research, like, cool, let's work together. That's where we're going. I am very hopeful. Yes. 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 That's same. a beautiful ending to the, the like that idea of like the functional medicine and conventional like that fight. But it's like the beautiful ending is like, no, we all get along and more knowledge is more knowledge and teaching the conventional world of like, hey, look at these like little cells. Look what's going on. Like it matters. And it's, yeah, that's a great and Great I think it all falls down to scope of practice. I mean, I think as nutritionists, you're so taught about the importance of scope of practice. Don't go outside your scope of practice. And I wish that was just more universally accepted mm -hmm. for somebody to be like, oh, well, you know what? Nutrition is not my scope of practice as an MD, but let me refer you to somebody mm -hmm. who is. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know why that's a problem. So yes, yep. <laughs> everybody working together feels like such an essential thing. Um, mm -hmm. So for people who are listening right now who Okay, let's say they've done the blood work and they know they have a thyroid issue. Mm -hmm. And we're assuming at this point that they're working with a specialist. But what are some of the things that you implement in your um, practice with your clients to help start healing the yeah. thyroid, start regulating those hormones? What are some of the lifestyle factors that you implement? Yes, well, it's really going to depend if we do have access to lab work, it's going to depend on specifically what's going on with their thyroid. So I'll take uh, maybe Hashimoto's angle to it and then just a general hypothyroid. I do have some clients clients, by the way, with hyperthyroid, mm. but it's much more rare. Yeah, like yeah. I'm guessing in my experience, maybe 5% or less of my clients have high thyroid and 95% or more have low thyroid. So I think we'll spend most of the time talking about that. For Hashimoto's, uh, my approach is A, working with the client and meeting them wherever they are. But honestly, I do feel for this one, we've got to reduce some of those things that confuse our uh, immune system into inciting that attack even further. And one of those is gluten. So yeah. again, some pe I have clients with Hashimoto's and they're like, absolutely no, not going to do it. And I'm like, okay, we're going to do our best without that. And that's fine. I never make anyone do anything. Mm -hmm. But if someone's like, I feel so bad. I want to do anything possible. Then I am going to have them get off gluten just for a couple months and see yeah. how it goes. Oftentimes then they're feeling so much better. They don't want to go on it. But because of the connection with gluten and autoimmune reactions and gluten and leaky gut, and we can parse out those connections if you want, I just think it makes sense in the cooling off phase to get off of that. And then once we take that out, really focusing on how well we can nourish our bodies. So oftentimes these high charging, hard charging people, they're eating food during the day, but a lot of it is like coffee and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever yes. they can grab the sandwich from downstairs. And they're really not thinking about getting in nourishment. So making sure that we're getting in adequate protein, adequate, healthy fats, micronutrients, and we don't have to count. We don't have to learn like how much selenium do you need during the day, which is important for your thyroid. Let's just focus on 
Maybe you eat some uh, Brazil nuts, which are rich in selenium, and maybe you eat a wide variety of, of nutrients. I have my clients count the colors of vegetables that they can get in during the day or even count the servings. And I do this because this is a fist size, which is a serving to me. So many people will tell me, oh, yeah, I'm eating healthily. Like, yeah, I'm eating vegetables. And then I'll just say, okay, for a week, put a tally on this post-it note for every vegetable they eat. And they come back and they're like, oh, my gosh, like it was two this week. And I'm like, "Okay, great. Now we have a starting place. Mm -hmm. We've got to get some more nourishing foods in people in order for their body to heal the thyroid and stop the autoimmune reaction. So a wide variety of vegetables and whole foods and then to some extent reducing all of these things that are crutches for, again, these high achievers, but caffeine, sugar, mm -hmm. alcohol, lots of this stuff can interfere with our appropriate thyroid function. Mm -hmm. So just from a food side, that's where I would start. But kind of like what I said at the beginning, we can do all the right things with food. And if we're not sleeping, if we're not uh, managing our stress, if we're under or over exercising, it is like a Goldilocks zone, mm. then our thyroid still can't fully heal. So I really think it's important to, again, meet someone where it is. Sometimes my goals for stress management with clients are like, I would like you to literally breathe for 60 seconds once a day. And mm. that's it. Like we're not going full blown eight hours of yoga a day. <laughs> we're taking where they are and seeing if they can do a little more. And then maybe we transfer into like, can you get outside for 10 minutes in a day? Mm -hmm. And then can you like get to bed 30 minutes earlier? We'll build on it. But stress management has to not be stressful right. in order to be successful. So that's a lot of me talking. Let me zip it and see what you have to say about that. No, I think that's that perfect. Was, I could listen to you yeah. keep talking all day. So Yeah, that was <laughs> awesome. And it, it really is true, like thinking of my husband with this. It's like how much like you nailed the, the it on the head with my husband, like the caffeine he needs and all that and very like that charging energy. Um, and he also, he cut out gluten from our functional medicine doctor's recommendation up here. And he would be a hard sell because he doesn't like those kind of restrictions. But now he loves it. And now he has our whole family is gluten free and he is like committed. And, you know, nowadays there are enough like alternatives that, you know, like it's, mm -hmm. it's easier now than it was 10 years ago. Um, though I know you also shouldn't just rely on those because they're often processed. But as far as the transition goes we're hooked up on on things at the at the local grocery store yeah um and i oh yeah. sorry no go ahead i was just gonna say i love the meeting people where they're at part yes. of it that's yep. definitely something i've discovered over time is if you go too hardcore too fast people burn out yes really quickly with yes. like all the changes they're trying to implement so i love the hey even if what we're adding in is 60 seconds of yep. of intentional breathing yep. in a day I love that because I think it's when you start adding in everything you know, mm -hmm. which would be my inclination. I'm like, I want you to feel better as soon as possible. So we want to make all the dietary changes, all the lifestyle changes. I want you to meditate for 15 minutes every morning. I want you to go outside for five minutes, for like 10 minutes first uh -huh. thing in the morning. Yep. Eat within two hours of waking up. And yep. pretty soon you kind of add all these layers that suddenly people feel overwhelmed. Yes. And if they're not doing one of them, they feel like they're not succeeding. Yes. And so I think that's something I've learned in my practice too, of just really meeting people where they're yes. at. And for anybody who's listening, giving yourself the grace to meet yourself where you're at. Mm -hmm. So instead of throwing, unless you are the kind of person that has to go all in, <laughs> um, which there are a few of those, but if you're somebody that needs to take simple steps, being okay with taking the smaller steps. Maybe the first thing you start with is just removing gluten and that's yep. all you do. Like yeah, you can do that. That's okay. That's yeah. a big one. Like yeah. you said. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm, I, it's, that's a really hard, hard balance mm -hmm. for me as a practitioner. And I, I am interested to hear that you're kind of striking that balance too, because people tell me they want everything. Right. People, you know, they've spent the money, they've gotten up the, they've done their Google research or whatever, they've gotten to the office or gotten on Zoom and they're like, okay, now I'm ready to make all these changes. 
And I want, like you said, because I know this stuff, I want to give them 58 things to do because mm-hmm. I know they're all beneficial, mm-hmm. but I know deep down inside it's not helpful because yeah. no one can make 58 changes in yeah. a day or a week or whatever. And so now my ego wants to give them everything and they think they want everything, but I'm still not. It's like, mm-hmm. it's really challenging for me to do, but I know it works better when I drip it out slowly. Yeah. yeah. Give absolutely. it like a two year. I feel like a Laney was trying to get me off of gluten and sugar for years, but I think it, it took me a good two years to get there. So it's like, give your people two years, you know, to make yeah. all the changes. Um, okay. I had a question. So at the beginning with your thyroid health was bad. What was when you were 26, were your numbers bad enough that it was Hashimoto's or was it just a thyroid problem? And then also what were all the things that you did to heal and how long did it take for you to heal? Great question. So the specific answer is I'm sure my thyroid numbers were terrible, but at that point I wasn't running Mm. lab work and they were only testing TSH. And so it was like kind of high, but not terrible. Okay. What was terrible were my sex hormones, my estrogen and progesterone and DHEA, even testosterone, like everything was in the toilet. When did you you have kids at the time? On a lab when it says like, sorry, what was that? Did you have any kids at the time? No, I still don't have any kids. So at that point, I could not, if I had wanted to have kids at 26, it would not have been biologically possible for my body to do that. Like my hormones were so bad um, that just nothing was working. Like I lost my period, everything that you can think of hormonally. Yeah. Technically, like if you really want to be technical with it, I went through menopause because menopause is defined as not having a period for 12 years and having really low hormone levels. Wow. Now, I don't actually think that. I I think maybe I'll understand in the future when I go through menopause, quote, for real, Mm -hmm. maybe I'll understand what it feels like a little bit more because I felt all those ways. But my period came back and all this kind of stuff. So I don't actually say that I went through menopause. Yeah. Uh, But those are the hormones that were measured to be low. Now, knowing what I know now, hormones all work together in a symphony. So it's impossible to have your estrogen and progesterone be off and not have your cortisol, which is a hormone, be off, not have Mm. your insulin, which is a hormone, be off. I would get a blood test for just like fasting blood sugar or something like that. A1C, like great if someone would order it, but probably not back then. Mm -hmm. And I was eating very well even back then, but I would have like really high blood sugar numbers that I just couldn't explain. Now I know all of this stuff was working Mm. together. And when one of these hormones is off, like just imagine an orchestra, if the violinist starts going crazy, then the cellist and the other people are going to try to like do different things to either match the violinist or (laughs) cover up the violinist or whatever. And that's what our hormones are doing too. When one goes rogue, the others are kind of trying to fluctuate in order to compensate for whatever's going off. So I would love to say that I had an answer, like I found a pill or something Mm -hmm. like that and I solved myself in a month. It did not happen like that. It was honestly more like you said, like a two year, maybe a little short, maybe like a year and a half, but Mm -hmm. uh, not a month for sure. Period of me just listening to my body Uh and really trying to give it what I knew it needed instead of what my ego was wanted. So that meant more sleep. I went from sleeping about four hours a night, which makes me cringe now Ah! to uh, easing up. I still am not one of those who gets like 10 hours of sleep per night, but very minimum right now is seven. And I try to go for eight hours. That in itself made a ginormous difference. I would have been a zombie with four hours. Wow. You know what? Like looking back, I, I'm like, okay, I can see that I was not operating at peak potential. And like I said, I was snapping at my family. That mm-hmm. surely was because I was tired. But I'm never someone who's had brain fog. I'm never someone who's like, oh. you know, just crashed and taken a nap in the middle of the day, even if I didn't want to. So I was lying to myself by saying, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm one of those unicorns who only needs four hours four of sleep. Hours Turns sleep. out I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I I could lie to myself. So sleep was a big one for me. I love running. I still love running. But at the time, I was only doing running. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that very few females, I hate, I love being a woman. There are so many amazing things about being female, but I think for females in particular, too much endurance cardio is just not a great thing if we have precarious hormones at all. So I still run, but I needed for me to switch to from running every day to having some Pilates, having some strength training, doing some yoga, Mm -hmm. even lifting heavy weights or like doing a a, a dance class or something like that. I just needed to mix it up. So I wasn't running all the time. And really that strength training, I think helped me. Um, I was, like I said, eating fairly well. So I was not, um, you know, eating the standard American diet. But if I really examined myself, I could have traded some, I love chocolate. I eat chocolate every day Mm. still. It's amazing. So I'm not bashing on anyone who has their square of dark chocolate and loves it. But I started to notice like, okay, you're having chocolate four or five times a day. Uh And you're maybe that's taking the place of like what you really need, which is some protein or something Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So I needed to make some of those trade-offs without going totally crazy. Um, I did actually at that that point, well, let me make sure I'm getting my time schedule correct. I finally gave up gluten for good in 2013. So I guess I got better hormonally and all of that stuff without giving up gluten. Mm. But now in hindsight, I can say that for me, that's a big part of it. And now I'm realizing I didn't answer your question. No, I I have never been diagnosed with Hashimoto's or had any blood test indicating it was Hashimoto's. I kind of feel like Now, I don't know if I had tested my TPO and TG antibodies back then, would it Mm -hmm. have indicated some kind of autoimmune reaction? I don't know because I've Mm -hmm. seen so many people get their numbers down and it's possible that I might have it underlying and my lifestyle is masking it, but I don't know that. Yeah. And, and, you know, the anti-TPO and some of those thyroid antibodies are just one possible outcome of any autoimmune condition and autoimmune conditions can take so many different tracks. And so it's, it sounds like just through your lifestyle, you had kind of created, um, the opportunity for an autoimmune condition to arise. And you may have had some self antibodies arising, but you caught it before you had any of the like symptoms that would have indicated any specific autoimmune condition. I would, love if you could take just I know it's like a topic for its own podcast but if you could take a a few minutes and walk us through why gluten affects the thyroid Mm -hmm. and some of the connections between gut health and thyroid health and why that matters sure it's um it's easy to do either an oversimplification or give you the 10-hour version yeah and so I'm going to try to strike the middle uh but please fill in too with uh, what you know and or ask me questions. The gut health passage, I'll start with first. So there is um, a a component called zonulin, a protein called zonulin that I like to think of like the gatekeeper of your gut, or maybe even we'll take the analogy to something some people will remember, like the bouncer of your gut. (laughs) So a bouncer, what is the bouncer's job? to stop everyone at the door and let in the good guys and keep out the bad guys, right? I'm I'm oversimplifying, I know. No, I love but it. But if we think of zonulin as the bouncer between your gut, what the where the food is inside your intestine and your bloodstream, its job is to let in the good guys and keep out the bad guys. But gluten, for whatever reason, makes the bouncer like drunk. The (laughs) bouncer goes crazy and starts letting everyone in. So now we have a drunk bouncer in our gut. It's letting everything into the bloodstream. And this is what we call leaky gut. Mm. So instead of being a semi-permeable junction, which only lets in specific nutrients, like if I eat broccoli, it's supposed to let in vitamin C into my bloodstream and iron and whatever else. It's not supposed to let in big chunks of broccoli, but my bouncer's drunk because gluten activated zonulin. Gluten is like the alcohol that we give to the bouncer that makes the bouncer let everything in. Gluten is just like lock and key for that zonulin and the gates open and we cause leaky gut. So why does that matter for the thyroid? 
and specifically autoimmune conditions. Once we have stuff floating around in the bloodstream that's not supposed to be there, our immune system does its job. Our immune system recognizes, hey, broccoli's in the bloodstream. That's weird. Let's start attacking it and neutralizing it. And that attack creates inflammation. Now, the audience, I'm sure, has heard about inflammation because it's like, everywhere these days because it's increasing and we're realizing that it's the root cause of basically everything. But if we think of that happening constantly, inflammation, immune system activation, our bouncer is drunk, so lots of stuff is sneaking into the bloodstream, then what we can picture is an overactive immune system. Mm -hmm. Our immune system's on high alert to everything because there's so much stuff in the bloodstream that's not supposed to be there that it's constantly like firing its weapons. And when we have an overactive immune system, that can lead to autoimmunity. Most people think that we need to have some genetic predisposition. I I think that I'll although we really scientifically don't know for absolute sure. But let's say we have to have this genetic predisposition and then we have this drunk bouncer. So now our immune system's hyperactive. That can trigger the autoimmune attack on whatever, on your thyroid, your pancreas, your skin or whatever else. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a great explanation. Mm -hmm. And I think perfect for our audience too and, and where they're at. And we've talked about it you know, in our Gut Health 101 episode and some of those episodes. And I think, you know, not to get too specific about it, but even the genetic predisposition, I think it's so hard to figure out the balance between what is environment that we're in that we share with our relatives and what is actually genetic. Because I know autoimmune conditions seem to show up in genetic patterns that when a parent has one, the kids often have one. Um, and and like a cousin might have one and then this person has one and they don't always share yeah. direct environments. So there really does seem to be a genetic component. But I also think through our understanding of epigenetics, there are certain things we can run into that can switch genes mm -hmm. on or off where you know, for example, my grandmother and all of her siblings had breast cancer, which turned out to be more of a result of the fact that they grew up in Greece and they would spray their floor with pesticides. And so as kids, they all crawled mm -hmm. on that floor, became exposed to those pesticides. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we did all the genetic testing since breast cancer was so prevalent in my family and had none of the genetics. But then my mom still developed breast cancer. And so it's this wow. interesting thing where I think it's there can be toxins that flip genes or flip like predispositions yeah. on or yeah. off. And I even I personally had endometriosis or have it, I'm, I think we've gotten it under control, but I read that that can be turned on, like the genetics for that or the pre-existing like underlying conditions to develop that can be turned on by a grandparent's exposure to pesticides. Wow. So even though it's like, I might not be growing up in an environment where I'm being exposed to those things, a family member being exposed to certain environmental toxins can turn on a whole pathway for a couple generations where they're more prone to developing certain conditions because of that one ancestor's exposure to something. Wow. That is so fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. And I couldn't agree more. I think we're close kind of to understanding epigenetics and what that actually means. What's the interaction between our environment and our genetics? But I think we're in some ways still so far. We we don't understand. I have a somewhat similar experience where my sister and her husband have type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune condition. And so we're very active in the type 1 diabetes community and go to the conferences and whatever. And they offered a genetic test. And it turns out I don't have the, gen quote, the genetics for type 1 diabetes, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But I really, really believe in my heart of hearts, if I lost all of my lifestyle habits and like went rogue, not one day, but like, mm -hmm. like years and decades on end, could I trigger it? I believe I could. This gives me motivation to um, keep treating my body the way I want to treat it. So I'm just going to keep believing that. Mm -hmm. But I think at the end of the day, we don't know exactly. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Absolutely. I agree with that. Absolutely. Um, I had a question. What does a day in your life look like now? to make your body in peak wellness in your mind. What's like your typical wellness 
a full day. Okay. Yes. So fun. Uh, um, I will try to do the short version. Okay. I wake up very, very early. So okay. I wake up at, depending on the day, 4.30, 4.40, or 4.50. Oh, you still and do. Oh, I my have, word. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I still do because I have this long morning routine, which is my absolute favorite health habit. Yes. I promise you I would not be the person that I am today if I didn't do my morning routine. It's just like my favorite time of day. So I've developed it into Mm -hmm. a longer thing. But where it started was saying three things I was grateful for and not even writing them down initially. Now I I do a short meditation. I do gratitude still. I read. I love reading. So I do some reading in there. I go through a plan for my day. I set like one goal for the day so I can end the day feeling accomplished. Mm-hmm. I do all of this kind of stuff that I put in an acronym that's called wake up and go. Mm-hmm. Um, and listeners can just Google wake up and go lion share or something. You can see all that stuff. Okay. But yeah. I really just encourage people to make their own morning routine. Even if it's 30 seconds as you're walking to get the baby out of the crib, mm-hmm. you can still think of one thing you're grateful for or something like that. So morning routine first. Um, in there, I do some apple cider vinegar and water. Mm-hmm. I like to drink a lot of water before I get into coffee, but I do like coffee still, yeah. even though I have healthy hormones now and all this stuff. So I have coffee after that. I do a workout still, but it's just much different. Mm-hmm. Like I said, some days it's yoga. Some days it is still running. Some days it's weights. It's just varied. Um, and then I eat some breakfast. I get into my work day. My breakfast is kind of weird to some people. I love savory breakfast, mm-hmm. not for taste. I'm still someone who craves sweet a hundred times out of a hundred, yep. but savory breakfast really sets me up for fewer cravings during the day. So I'm often like today I had a breakfast hash, which had some ground turkey, some broccoli sauce, some parsnips, some zucchini, some apples, some really good spices. Oh, so sweet. Oh, will you cry, um, I, I get distracted by babies. Yes. Very, very cute. She needed mama to hug her. We're just going to come back and watch. We're doing wellness routine in the morning and her morning is glorious already. I'm here oh, for it. I'm, I'm ready. And your savory, yes. savory breakfasts. <laughs> savory breakfast. So I get that in. Then I start my work day. Right now I'm standing. I alternate standing and sitting all throughout the day. So I'll generally have 10 or so calls between clients and doing podcasts, doing my own podcast, meeting with my team or other people. And for me, it just works out really well to sit and stand. I do try to take little movement breaks. So about like five feet away from me, I have one of those rebounders and I'll just bounce a couple times or I'll step outside for two minutes or something like that. I'm drinking a whole lot of water during the day, um, electrolytes, hot tea like I have now, Mm -hmm. just really keeping myself hydrated through the day. Um, And then sometime during the day, I like to, uh, it sounds a little crazy, but I actually really like it. If I have a phone client, not Zoom, I like to just be on the floor. I think this is really important for my wellness and we don't do this very much, but I'll like lay on the floor, I'll stretch, I'll sit on the floor. We're often either in chairs, which are necessary and, Mm -hmm. and I use chairs or we're standing or we're walking or whatever. And we've lost that uh, ability to be on the floor. So I do that sometime yeah. during the day. And then at night, I eat dinner with my husband. I um, kind of wind down. I do a little foam rolling. I take some magnesium. I read a novel before bed. I really try to slow my brain down uh, in order to get good sleep. And because I go to bed so, I mean, because I wake up so early, mm-hmm. I go to bed so early, but I love yeah. that too. I, I really, I think this is my natural rhythm. Yes, I love that. that is so cool. And it's really neat how like you are such a high performing person that you really are intentional about your wellness and you have it more of like a rhythm and a way of being throughout your day that you can sustain it, which is really, really cool. And um, it goes to show now that I would say that your thyroid and hormones are all at normal levels. Yes, I honestly believe that 
for me and for most people, having habits is so much more effective than requiring willpower. Yeah. So I know I'm going to meditate every day. Mm-hmm. It doesn't require any willpower at all because it's built into my routine. It's a habit. It's something that I'm used to doing. I see the benefits. Like my dogs know when I go sit in this area, they know to chill out. Everything just flows versus yeah. if I said to myself, oh, Megan, you really should meditate should. today. I hate yeah. the word should. But yes, right. It just crawls. It, yeah, it makes me crawl in my skin. Yep. But then I'm thinking about it all day. Okay, I should meditate. I don't really want to. Should I do this now? Should I do it later? Maybe mm-hmm. I could do it tomorrow. It's like so much brain power that I just don't want to spend. So things like automating uh, my healthy food decisions, automating my morning routine, knowing my wind down routine, even as far as like my planner for the day, I go through the day before and I I write in not only the meetings, but also what I'm going to do. If I don't have a meeting for 30 minutes, well, what task am I going to do? I want to make that decision in advance so that Mm -hmm. I don't have all of that mental energy wasted by having to make those decisions. Yep. Yep. More of this, like you're deciding on what you want for your life, not all this reactive decision making. Yes. Yep. Um, Exactly. I know we're coming to the end. So I have three quick fireball questions I'm going to throw at you and then we can um, get more to our ending. But so really quick, which we talk um, a lot on these topics on the podcast, but I'm just curious and don't worry, they're hot topics, but kind of what's your thought on dairy? What would you say for your, your oh, people? Oh, gosh, really dairy? quick. Yeah, I, I know hard, it's a big but topic. The, the but. quick answer is I, I actually think that real, unpasteurized, non-hormone, non-antibiotic dairy can be a very healthy food for many people. And also, most of the conventional dairy that we're getting is too inflammatory for people. And we're having, I think the average American is having dairy like eight times a day or something Mm -hmm. like that. So for most people, I do recommend a reduction and an improvement in quality. But for a lot of people, I don't think they have to take it out fully. Okay. We, I feel that. I feel that. Um, next. Oh, sugar. What's your opinion on sugar, both for people with the thyroid problems or just a general population? So sugar itself, I mean, celery has sugar. Kale has sugar. There is sugar as a chemical structure in a lot of healthy foods. And I definitely don't think we have to take that all out fully. Mm-hmm. However, again, the abundance of sugar that we're consuming is just not helping our health in any way. Mm -hmm. So I just encourage people to not only be aware of all the added sugar, like the cupcakes and the cookies and whatever, and slowly start cutting that back. But where are you getting sneaky added sugar, Mm -hmm. which is like, oh, my salad dressing, it only has six grams, but you're doing that. And then your coffee creamer has five grams and then your bread has a couple grams and then your whatever. And it really adds up during the day. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of sugar consumption, almost everyone needs to reduce it, unfortunately. Okay, fair. Then the my last one. Oh my gosh, it just escaped my brain. What was it here? Oh god. Oh I know. Um protein. Um how I guess what's a good goal for someone to get in grams for protein in a day? Yeah. Again, will depend on the person and their goals and their physical activity and any conditions they're dealing with. Certainly if they have an existing kidney condition, maybe less. But I think the bare minimum, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram, that's way too low for people. Mm -hmm. For most of my clients who are in a healing phase, whether it's healing from an autoimmune condition or something like that, I'm going as high as one gram per pound of body weight. So if someone weighs 150 pounds, 150 grams of protein, which is way higher than the recommendation. And then for just like the average person who is not necessarily in a healing phase, doesn't necessarily have extreme physical activity loads or something like that, more like half to three quarters of a gram per pound of body weight. So for that 150 pound person, that's between 75 and 100 grams. Wow, that's great because I love, love, love protein. So that um, rings well for me, true. Um, And my last kind of question for you was just that um, what would you, 
well, first off, if there's anything we haven't covered, I do want you to just spill out some of your knowledge there. But also, what would be kind of your kind of token advice that you want our listeners to know from you, like your way of thinking about a healthy lifestyle? What's some token advice you can give our listeners? Oh, I love that. It's a hard question. But I think if you ask people who are in that program, Revitalized Health Accelerator, they're always repeating mechanisms back to me. I think what they would probably say is start where you are, which we've already talked about, take one step in the right direction today, and then celebrate it. So it's important to break that down. Start where you are because everyone has a different uh, starting place and that's okay. Take one step. Don't make it overcomplicated in the right direction. And most people know what the right direction is. Mm -hmm. If I say to people, okay, here's a magic button. It can change anything about your health you want. One person will say, oh, I haven't exercised in five years. And the next person will say, I drink too much coffee. And the next person will say, I eat too many M&Ms or whatever, but they know intuitively. Mm -hmm. So take that step in the right direction. And then the last part was celebrate it. We're so hard on ourselves Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. we can't be hard on ourselves and be successful in the long term with health. We've got to learn to cheer ourselves on. And it makes people roll their eyes at the beginning and that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. I rolled my eyes, but I ask people at the beginning of each session, what can we celebrate about last week? What went well? They want to come in and tell me, oh, I'm so sorry. I ate Taco Bell. And I'm like, I don't want to hear about that. I want to hear about what you did great for yourself to get us in the right mentality. And then we can move on and work on making making some improvements. So I think that would be my parting advice. People know it in their gut what to do. And and this is hard and you're dealing with a million other priorities. I know everyone else listening is already busy and full and all of this kind of stuff, but you can do it. I've seen so many people change their health for the positive and I'd love for the listeners to be the next ones. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Celebrating is so important. And we oftentimes, especially those of us that are very driven, Mm-hmm. Our, we don't take time to celebrate anything. It's like we have, whether it's a big win or a small win, and we just want to move on to what the next thing is. It's like, okay, great, I did that. What's next? You know, <laughs> and we just don't take the yes. time to celebrate uh-huh. it like we should. Mm-hmm. So I love that being very intentional about, no, let's start with the things that you did right and mm-hmm. focus on those. And then we can work on improving the other things, but it's so much more encouraging yeah. that yeah. way. Yeah. And you have such a good mindset. And I know that you're helping like hundreds, if not thousands of people through things just from um, your knowledge. And I mean, your mindset is clutch. So really good job there. Is, is there anything else more that you want to share today that we didn't get to? And also, how can our listeners find you on the web? Well, I can always talk. That's never been a problem, (laughs) but I think we did a great job of covering everything that was on my mind today. Um, In terms of where people can find me, my website is thelionshare.org. There are two S's in there. So lions with an S, L-Y-O-N-S, and then share.org. And then Instagram is probably my most, definitely my most active of the social media and I'm at the lion's share there as well and would love to connect with people help them out as much as I can there's a lot of free stuff on my website so even just starting there there's like a fun 50-day challenge where you get a new uh, thing that you can do each day maybe it's that 60 seconds of breathing or maybe it's eating another vegetable or something like that there's just a lot of good resources so head on over there and I look forward to hearing from anyone Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Megan. You have just been, I think, a light in the darkness for so many people. And now for our listeners on this show, it's been a privilege to have you on. Yes, you are brilliant. And thank you for your work in the world. All right. Thank you both so much. It's been a lot of fun. Awesome. And to our listeners, go be renegades. Go be renegades. Thank you for listening to the Renegade Nutrition Podcast. Please keep in mind that this podcast is an educational service that provides general health information. The content on this podcast is not a substitute for direct, personal, professional medical care and diagnosis. You should always talk to your doctor before making a dietary or lifestyle change. Go be renegades! Go be renegades!